we are live now. Hello and uh, welcome everyone to another episode of Whitey Talks featuring Elias Kono, the nature lover. I am Onkun Dajjai and with me is Matul Jorokman. Hello everyone. Uh, so we will invite our guest within a few minutes. Um, so uh, get ready with your seat belts. Well, not for going to space, but to the entrance of our origin. And we have a huge surprise for you. So stay tuned till the end. But before that, we have a quest for you. Within our takeoff, you have to share this live video, live uh, stream with everyone you know as soon as possible. Now we will start the countdown and off we go in three, two, one. We know the code. Dogs are man's best friend. And though they are called man's best friend, we are seeing them as our enemies. We are torturing these innocent creatures miserably. How? According to Dhaka Tribune, in our country, stray dogs are being relocated illegally. So why remains our duty as the best friend? Can we be even called human? Now let's get into the depth of human nature wild relationships from our today's guest of honor, Elliot Connor, CEO, EcoLive, author, doco producer, TEDx speaker, founder of International Environment NGO Human Nature Projects. So let's uh, welcome our guest then. Hello, sir, and welcome to our show. Greetings from Youth Talents and Bangladesh too. I am Ankan Joy, and with me is Madhur Jo. We'll be Hello, your throughout this session. Uh, Thank sir. you for the wonderful introduction. Looking forward to an interesting conversation. Yes, sir, obviously. So we love our mothers, don't we? But can you imagine giving up pain, let alone pulling the hair of your mother? Well, what we are doing uh, to our mother earth again and again is equivalent to that. We are torturing her for living our lavish lives. We are literally pulling her hair and doing much worse. So what is the use of this mother giving us everything since our birth? But there are exceptions. Many people have dedicated themselves for the sole cause of protecting this Mother Earth. And one of the greatest and brightest examples is our guest of honor, Sir Elliot Connor. Sir is working specifically for human nature wild relationships. So, sir, would you please tell us about the aim of your vision and how to prosper and fulfill our duties toward Mother Earth? Yeah, well, definitely. So as you say, uh, my life's goal is to reframe our human relationship with nature, uh, trying to empower especially global citizens to uh, be more aware of these environmental issues, be more aware of the impact they're having on our planet. And uh, through that, then empowering them uh, to be able to uh, change, uh, mitigate some of those impacts. And also to be able to uh, start on that journey towards uh, regeneration, towards being part of uh, this solution, so being part of environmental volunteering, conservation dialogues. I think as we're seeing with uh, this new globalised world we're living in, and COVID is a beautiful demonstration of it, uh, but we're all growing much, much closer together. Uh, we're breaking down some of those barriers between countries, languages, cultures. Uh, so essentially human age projects and the work I do is trying to unite people in this field and uh, be able to arrive at solutions together. Uh, that's great, sir. So uh, surprise your audience. We have a huge surprise for, for you and now we will mention that. So let's play a game. Uh, if you want awareness to spread regarding this, 
please share our live stream with your eco lover friends and after sharing mention your friend's name who came to watch this show in the comment section and after that in the uh, end of the show we will announce the person who will mention the highest number of friends with home they have shared the live and are watching this show right now as one of the nature lovers and we will feature his story about nature on the page on our page and let the game begin which will be continued till the end and now we will go back to our guests so this covid 19 was spread by bats and today we are witnessing the worst can this be related to nature's effect on human behavior definitely yeah covid as you say is a zoonotic disease so it comes from uh, this illegal wildlife trade as you mentioned through bats i think pangolins have also been implicated so coming through uh, there's wet markets in China uh, having that transmission uh, through various animals to humans. And I think as we will see over the coming years, if we don't uh, rapidly change uh, matters in terms of our human relationship with nature, uh, we will be getting more of these zoonotic diseases. Uh, nature has been put under stress, uh, which means they're much, much more likely to make that transition. So I do think it's a really important wake up call in terms of what we've been doing to nature and in terms of uh, the urgency for us to change. Uh, so for example, shutting down those wet markets in China, uh, which actually happened very early on in the pandemic. Uh, so that has been, I guess, one good thing to come out of uh, this global catastrophe, uh, but we need to maintain measures like that. And we have to obviously have to scale them uh, so that they encompass this international community having just these localized solutions isn't enough uh, but if we can scale them globally uh, then that's where we're headed yes sir we completely agree with you uh, we know that today deals uh, the future assets of this world how do you think that this asset can be used to save the world climate how do I think the youth can help save the world's climate? Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's a good question. Uh, so I think as we're seeing in this environmental space over the past five odd years, uh, the uh, youth movement there has been growing tremendously. Uh, obviously, I'm part of that. I'm 17 years old. Uh, but I have seen uh, throughout the course of uh, my short career uh, that the uh, momentum, the impetus carried uh, by youth voices uh, in this field is very much being amplified as we move forward. Uh, so uh, we're starting to see youth dialogues emerging and these high forums in the UN and IUCN in uh, COP uh, dialogues as well. As we uh, move into 2021, uh, where we have all of these environmental conferences coming up, uh, then uh, youth are taking centre stage. And uh, that's really inspiring to see in terms of individual actions uh, that obviously is where anyone can make a difference so uh, the youth uh, strikes the fighters for future movement has uh, shown us the power of individuals banding together to form these collectives uh, but anyone can uh, be able to offset uh, the carbon uh, through their lifestyle in traveling in the diet and what food they eat in some of their choices as for uh, transport in their job uh, however they choose to make this impact on the world uh, there's a wonderful Jane Goodall quote, uh, which is, uh, every day uh, you change the world, it's up to you to, to, to decide what change you'd like to make. Uh, so I think that's really important to keep in mind. Uh, we all have this footprint, uh, but it's deciding where our journey is going to lead. So we consider the wonderful audience as said, uh, if you can ask questions. So audience, uh, you are completely free to ask any questions to our guests. Our guests will be honored to answer those. So you can ask any questions you, you want to know about it. Thank you for, for uh, asking this question. Yes, you can ask. Sir, uh, we, we have come to know that you are only 17 at age now. I again mentioned that you are only 17. And, but still, you started the International Environmental NGO uh, Nature, Human Nature Project, which supports volunteers across uh, 104 countries. So how would you like to uh, know that we would like to know how you took your initiative and how you became a nature lover? Yeah, two very good questions. 
So I'll start with the how did I move into this space? How did I become a nature lover? And I think it's a lot to do with some of the experiences I've had, uh, the upbringing I've had. I've been very fortunate. So uh, it's my firm belief that, that anyone given the chance to immerse themselves in nature, uh, get out into uh, the wild and experience uh, that beauty uh, that we see in these natural spaces is almost predestined to enter into this field, uh, to care, to protect them and to conserve them as I'm doing. And the other part of that obviously is building a bond, a relationship with other animals. Uh, so I actually do animal rescuing uh, here in Sydney where I am. Uh, so I take in injured wildlife, I rescue that and rehabilitate it uh, and to back to health and then release it. So uh, that's very, very rewarding work for me. And it allows me to uh, get up close and personal with these animals uh, to build very, very strong uh, bonds, connections with them. Uh, so uh, those uh, two factors have definitely shaped who I am today. Uh, as for how I started Human Nature Projects, uh, that story actually goes back to January of last year. And at the time, I was uh, volunteering at a uh, bird of prey and hedgehog uh, rehabilitation centre in southern France. So I was over there uh, near the Alps in midwinter. And it was great. I spent about four weeks over there. Uh, but during some of the long winter nights I spent over there, I basically took the initiative to research the operations of maybe 200 major environmental NGOs. Uh, so I'd been volunteering quite extensively in the space uh, for a few years prior to that, uh, but found it quite challenging as a miner uh, to come across these opportunities to find the right networks to be part of, uh, especially in Australia, which is quite backwards in terms of conservation. Uh, so this was my way of gaining a foothold. Uh, but what it showed me essentially was that my experience uh, was uh, far from unusual, uh, that many of the larger names in the space uh, really struggled to engage with the wider public, uh, with youth, and especially in Australia, as I mentioned, uh, where I am. So that was my motivation for founding Human Nature Projects. And the charity essentially acts as a community as an entry point into environmental volunteering. Uh, but certainly uh, we've seen it success, succeed and scale over the past 14 months. I think that's just testament uh, to the power of this vision of this idea. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's been a wonderful journey for me. It was great to hear, sir. Uh, we see that one of our audience has raised a question that would you kindly suggest us the optimistic areas where we, the very, very young people, can progress in the post COVID 19? Yeah, so COVID 19 has definitely been a double edged sword for the space. Uh, obviously, it has uh, produced some setbacks. We've seen uh, many of these major environmental conferences uh, postponed or uh, cancelled uh, due to uh, difficulties in traveling. Uh, we've seen, obviously, some funding cuts. We've seen uh, some challenges to the philanthropic space as well. Uh, but one thing that's I found certainly really inspiring, really beautiful, uh, that's come out of it, or two things, actually. Uh, so the first thing would be in terms of learning about nature's resilience, uh, seeing how it's recovered. Uh, so as uh, I guess we humans have removed some of our uh, impacts in the day-to-day -day, uh, business uh, from uh, these habitats, from these natural spaces, uh, there have been some uh, tremendous stories of nature reclaiming uh, the areas of nature, uh, rebounding, and that's really inspiring for me. Uh, I think that's definitely a, an opening, an opportunity for youth to step in uh, to amplify uh, these stories, this messaging, and to suggest ways in which we may be able to uh, change our day-to-day -day routine, uh, to be able to change how we go about uh, this uh, business of development in a way uh, which perhaps doesn't impact wildlife so much. So uh, that's one thing I've definitely learned uh, from the pandemic. And the second thing is the power of communities, uh, because obviously with COVID, we've seen a, a huge rise in global solidarity, in especially online communities yeah. uh, coming together uh, to share ideas, uh, to engage in these dialogues. Uh, so wonderful events like this, uh, webinars, are a great way to educate others about the issue at hand. 
uh, to share thoughts and ultimately uh, co-create solutions as well. Yes, we you parents uh, regularly organize this type of webinars on live shows to inspire the youth all over the world, and especially uh, in Bangladesh, we really try how to uh, inspire the youth for the future world to encourage them. We hope that we will be successful in our future. Definitely, definitely. And uh, the beautiful thing that nature teaches us is the butterfly effect. Uh, so the theory goes that the flapping of a butterfly's wings uh, can cause a hurricane in Texas. Uh, the idea being that a very small action, very small change, uh, can have this ripple effect, which makes a much, much larger impact uh, than you could have thought. So I think uh, events like this, a great example, if you plant that seed of an idea, uh, you just start these dialogues and who knows where they'll lead. Yes, sir. Uh, so, you, uh, as your opinion, you said the answer of this one, and obviously they are. How much engaging uh, was the youth in this regard and played uh, their role as the asset for this mother or do you think? Till now, how much engaging uh, were their acts? I have to ask you to repeat that. Uh, let me repeat again that. Uh, yes, uh, youths are uh, told to be the asset of this world. And how, what do you think that how much engaging uh, are the youths who are till now have been in this uh, regard for mother mother art or how, what are the uh, what about the role the youths are playing today what uh, will you suggest or what will you opine about them? Yeah, as uh, we mentioned briefly before, the role that youth play is quite interesting uh, within this space. Obviously, uh, very dynamic is fully evolving in terms of how we go about. Uh, environmentalism, conservation. So uh, it's, it's certainly going to change over the next five or 10 years. Uh, but currently the role I see youth playing is as these thought leaders, these idealists, these visionaries uh, who are able then to, uh, I guess, drive uh, our existing political leaders, our corporate stakeholders, our charities uh, towards more ambitious goals to hold them accountable and ultimately to uh, give rise to uh, this wonderful uh, grassroots movement that is environmentalism. Uh, it's a movement that's based on people, based on individual action, and people ultimately coming together uh, to form these groups, uh, to share ideas, and to create these solutions. So I think the role of the youth is very, very powerful in motivating, inspiring older generations, uh, but also uh, acting as uh, uh, those uh, forerunners of environmentalism. So being able to uh, really push the movement and add uh, a lot of uh, youthful energy and vision into some of these dialogues we're seeing. Uh, so that's my own opinion. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so Sir, you seem quite interested in doing wildlife photography. So, when did you start uh, uh, your um, when did you start this hobby, or what was the reason behind this? Yeah. So, interestingly, uh, my wildlife photography uh, sort of came about almost simultaneously uh, with my love of nature, with my entry into environmentalism. Uh, I guess it was that way of me to uh, really understand and appreciate nature. I think it really helps as a way to communicate that passion as well. Uh, so uh, the two really go hand in hand for me. Uh, I spent uh, very early on, maybe six months, uh, taking uh, many a spare afternoon to photograph the insects in my garden. And I'd then post them onto a citizen science website uh, so they could be identified. And so I could learn then uh, what all these insects were, about their life stories, uh, all about them so then I could share that with others uh, so I could um, better appreciate, better understand uh, these uh, memes. That's just one example and anyone could do that if you have a smartphone. Uh, the site's called iNaturalist, a very, very good way of getting into ecology, into nature appreciation. Uh, but yeah, increasingly I've found that uh, nature photography, wildlife photography uh, has allowed me to get out uh, more into these natural places. Uh, but importantly, to share uh, them and the animals that, that inhabit them uh, with many others. So 
uh, it's uh, something I love most about my work, uh, being able to share that passion. And uh, wildlife photography allows me to illustrate these stories I'm telling as just filmmaking. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I do have a bit of a uh, passion in photography, but uh, not that much in wildlife photography. And it is uh, really uh, rare to see the uh, many persons having this passion with the world, wild wildlife. And so, sir, uh, actually, I, I have an experience to share with you. A few years back, uh, I witnessed a Hollywood movie titled 2012, an American disaster film produced in 2009 and which depicted the end of the world in 2012 due to climate change as we all know that uh yes obviously the uh, ice is melting now in the both of the poles but uh, in the movie what it depicted was the whole world would go under water then and we all know about the ice and the art is just ruining uh, all of a sudden so what do you think would that uh, really occur as in these days of us and if it, yeah, if it is that occurring what should we do yeah, yeah. Climate change in terms of a Hollywood outlook is quite a slippery slope. Uh, I know that increasingly we've seen documentaries try and tackle it and they do so very well. Uh, so there are some really good ones out there. 2040 is a good one, uh, well worth watching. Uh, the Inconvenient Truth is obviously a classic as well. Uh, but all of these uh, are able to depict uh, the problem and the solutions very effectively. In terms of uh, what you mentioned, 2012 and uh, some of these more apocalyptic uh, uh, style uh, pieces, uh, obviously they are exaggerated. Uh, uh, current predictions say that we will see uh, some uh, significant warmings by the end of the century, some significant uh, sea level rises, changes in weather patterns, uh, if we don't act on climate change. Uh, but we are starting to uh, decrease these effects. So we are actions within the environmental space are already having an impact. So I think it's important uh, not to uh, overly dramatize the issues uh, we see at hand. Uh, often we see projections going exponentially, uh, rising up or just going linearly as if uh, we're not going to do anything. But that's not the truth. Uh, so we're already seeing uh, some tremendous action momentum uh, towards solving these issues. And uh, if, if you factor that into account, uh, then it's merely uh, a matter of scaling that as quickly and as efficiently as possible uh, so that we have the a minimum possible effects. Uh, obviously, uh, there are millions of species already threatened by our human activities, by climate change and uh, billions of dollars of damage uh, from uh, these processes, too. So uh, it, it's challenging. It's a challenging issue to solve. Uh, but. As for the apocalypse imminent, uh, it's more as uh, a question of trying to avoid some tipping points. Um, yes, sir, obviously. Uh, sir, I was uh, uh, so much curious about something. I want to know what your favorite animal is. <laughs> What's my favorite animal? The answer I often give is the African elephant. So uh, this January, I spent about six months uh, doing some wildlife filmmaking in South Africa. Uh, I was uh, acting as a cameraman for a company called Wild Earth TV. And what they do is they stream six hours of safari drives uh, to about a million viewers. Uh, so uh, going out in the vehicles twice a day. And that was amazing for me. Uh, incredible format they use, a brilliant experience. Uh, but the stars uh, of my time there were the elephants. Uh, we had a lot of rain, uh, so uh, abundant vegetation and got really up close and personal uh, with these incredibly intelligent, incredibly complex creatures. Uh, they are some of the most intelligent animals we know of, and we're still trying to understand their social lives and their communication. Uh, so that mystery uh, really, really interests me as well. Uh, but in terms of how similar they are to humans, in their emotions, in their lifestyles generally, in their characters, their individuality, uh, it was just incredible for me to see. And I can't quite uh, forget some of those vivid, vivid memories I've built. So, I mean, I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, people get into this field because uh, they see animals in their natural habitat, uh, because they learn to appreciate them. 
uh, for me, that was one of those pivotal moments uh, with the African elephants over there. Oh, that's wonderful, sir. So we all know that uh, elephants are being killed for their ivory. So how can it be stopped? People know that they shouldn't do this, but still they are doing such things. So what is your op opinion regarding this? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, poaching is one of those really, really challenging environmental issues to solve uh, as part of this human wildlife conflict. Uh, there are a number of solutions which are being used, which could be scaled. And uh, the reality is actually that anti-poaching measures are already highly, highly successful. Uh, so uh, recently we've had uh, the data come out to say that rhino poaching numbers in South Africa have halved over the past five years, uh, which is incredible news. I mean, uh, people think it's an increasingly dire situation everything's going to pot uh, but the reality is there's some amazing people working on these issues already in terms of how we can solve elephant poaching uh, there's any number of measures that have been suggested uh, the most simple one is providing alternative livelihoods to these communities uh, uh, for the most part people do it uh, because they have to because they're trying to feed families because is uh, it's a, a reliable source of income uh, for the poachers on the ground. Of course, uh, they have to be connected into these syndicates, these buying markets, uh, but the people who do the act uh, don't have a malicious intent in particular. Uh, they find it as a way of life more than anything. Uh, so uh, there are some really interesting projects around uh, developing alternative livelihoods for these communities, and that's helping. Uh, education is a great one. Obviously, if you get uh, the kids, the younger generation out into nature, get them to experience uh, uh, all these animals, and elephants in particular, then they'll uh, develop this bond, this appreciation for them, much, much less likely to uh, become involved in poaching uh, later down the track. Uh, but the final one then is just strong enforcement measures. So, I mean, it's all been done before using drones, using thermal imaging, using uh, regular nighttime patrols. Uh, there's been some interesting work in AI uh, predicting elephants' movements and that of poachers. Uh, so you can better uh, send out patrols to where uh, areas are most at risk. Uh, there have been some really interesting applications of uh, remote sensing technology uh, to see if you do have uh, potential uh, to have uh, these poachers on your property uh, some tracking dogs work uh, really successful again uh, so i mean the solutions are there uh, as is the case often in, in environmentalism it's about getting the support from uh, funders from the youth uh, from all of these stakeholders uh, to make sure these projects uh, do succeed and do scale as is necessary so we have a question from our audience uh, asking that Honestly speaking, after the COVID-19 COVID pandemic, as everyone is staying home, the environment carbon emissions were down and other pollutions as well. So, air, do, so sir, do you think human beings polluting the environment, the only reasons or something like volcanic eruption do contribute? Yeah, it, it's that classic question in uh, what used to be the climate change debate, uh, now more accepted scientific fact, to be honest. Uh, the truth is, uh, climate naturally does fluctuate. We have the ice ages, uh, but that's over a scale of millions of years uh, that we get this cycle. Uh, so going up, down, up, down, up, down. Uh, so we have the hot periods and then we have the ice ages. Uh, the, the glacial uh, regions advance to retreat. Uh, currently, uh, we're actually meant to be moving into an ice age. Uh, so uh, we're ha having the opposite effect in terms of CO2 emissions uh, it means uh, that we've caused global warming we've caused global temperatures to uh, change by over a degree uh, they've uh, risen on average by that amount uh, so uh, it's a case where it's very very hard to prove anything definitively but all the evidence points very very strongly uh, to humans being uh, the major if not the sole cause of uh, climate change global warming and uh, with any uh, self-regulating complex system uh, like climate, uh, then uh, there are many, many factors that come into play. Uh, but often it's the case that our human impacts are causing those uh, to move out of a balance and then uh, you end up with this uh, runaway effect. So if humans put this amount 
of uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, then that would cause uh, perhaps some sea ice to melt or uh, some of the frozen tundra, so some of the permafrost, uh, which releases more methane, more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So then you end up with that amount of effects and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, it's, it's one of those cases where modeling is very challenging to conduct. Uh, but we have some of the best scientists of our age working on it, and they all uh, somewhat agree on the predictions uh, that we'll reach uh, three degrees maybe by the end of the century if we don't uh, have any further action taken. So we have another question there that how can we effectively channel the enthusiasm of youth among communities apart from volunteerism and activism? Yeah, good question. Uh, I think uh, we mentioned it very briefly earlier, uh, but there's a really important role to be played uh, just by individual action. Uh, so not necessarily activism, uh, but uh, looking at your lifestyle, how you can change that, how you can contribute to a, 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 a more, more harmonious earth system uh, through your daily routine. So uh, whether it is eating less meat, whether it's walking or cycling, instead of taking a car or a public transport, uh, whatever it may be. And there's some wonderful sites out there in terms of how you can learn to do this. Uh, so, uh, I mean, an example is a site called You Change Earth, uh, launched actually last week. So uh, fresh on uh, the scene, uh, but there are a half dozen uh, similar counterparts. And all they do is provide you with actions, with opportunities to uh, change what you're doing in uh, whatever domain it is in education in professional life as a uh, as a worker uh, in your office space in your travel arrangements in your uh, in your uh, cuisine whatever it may be uh, but everything we do has an impact being able to measure and uh, mitigate some of those is just as important as being part of uh, communities or uh, being able to raise your voice in these dialogues Uh, yes, sir. So, sir, most of your works are being in, uh, implemented in Australia and uh, 104 other countries. And we already have mentioned about the dogs that are being killed in Dhaka City. So what should we do regarding this and how can we implement these steps in Bangladesh? Yeah, yeah, it's probably the hardest question you've asked. Uh, certainly, uh, we do have a major issue uh, with animal abuse of this sort. Uh, I mentioned I do uh, lots of animal care cases, animal rescues here in Sydney. Uh, so I see both the best and worst of humanity, uh, people who uh, call in these injured animals, uh, who uh, mention that they're sick and get someone to come out to rescue it, uh, to nurse it back to health. Uh, but also those cases where uh, human negligence or uh, direct uh, uh, harassment by humans has caused this injury to the animals. Uh, so uh, whenever we're working in a space like this, we will see both uh, the good side of human nature, uh, humans doing uh, really positive things uh, with uh, their life, with their time, in terms of interacting with other animals. And we will see the bad side. Uh, so cases like the abuses of dogs, uh, cases across Sydney that I see, in terms of uh, animals being maltreated and uh, some perhaps more than others uh, looking specifically at that case i mean uh, the the challenge uh, with any solution is being able to effectively implement and scale it, uh, so it requires obviously a lot of time and effort and resources so uh, what i'd say is in terms of education is obviously the best route if you can address the root cause of the issue uh, so trying to appeal uh, to to those responsible bodies and uh, appeal to their better nature, improve uh, how they may view uh, these canines uh, to prevent uh, the abuse. Uh, the second option then is uh, mitigation. Uh, so trying to intervene in cases where uh, you do find uh, these actions being taken, uh, taking place, uh, you do see them so you can intervene in situ uh, whilst uh, that is going on and the third would be uh, uh, sort of after the event. So trying to, uh, if possible, uh, nurse or care for uh, 
these dogs in any way possible. So uh, I care lots of animal uh, rehabilitators. I, I train them up here in Sydney uh, so that they can go out into their communities and do that. Uh, so it's a very rewarding job again for me uh, to be able to have that impact on so many people's lives. And this, as I mentioned earlier, one of these runaway effects, if you can uh, start a conversation with one person and they speak to another person, it all carries on. And uh, eventually those ripples will run through entire communities. Uh, ditto if you want to uh, train them, sensitize them to the issue and how they can address it. Uh, but it is one of those uh, areas uh, where we're seeing the worst of human nature come out. And unfortunately, there's no easy solution. So we can see that our audience are getting enthusiastic about our today's topic. Here we have another question. That what inspired you in the first place to start this journey with nature? So it seems that she's interested with you. Yeah, I mean, how far do you go back for a question like that? <laughs> I'm British by birth, so uh, born over there. And there's a very large bird watching scene. Uh, so brought up in family where some amateur nature appreciation was taking place. Uh, lots of long walks in the countryside, uh, perhaps traveling occasionally uh, to see wildlife. Uh, so uh, that obviously is the first step for anyone uh, to be able to get into this field if you can uh, get out into nature or experience it around uh, where you live. So uh, through uh, my capacities as an environmentalist in Sydney, I see uh, some incredible wildlife. And uh, everywhere I've been across the globe, uh, there's the same case, no matter where you are, even in huge metropolises like uh, Seoul uh, in South Korea, uh, uh, huge skyscrapers, but you still have urban wildlife there. So nature is everywhere and learning to uh, understand it, appreciate it in uh, wherever you may be is obviously a first step to be taken. Uh, for me, as I mentioned, I've been very fortunate with some of the experiences I had. Uh, so one in particular that shaped me very early on uh, was a, an experience I had in Botswana uh, when I was about 10 years old. So at the time I was camping with my family over there and we were walking back from the campsite toilet block actually at the time. Uh, so other end of the campground and this being a remote uh, campsite, uh, there was no fencing whatsoever as uh, so the animals were free to wander through uh, of all sorts. And I, I was wandering slightly behind, uh, sort of appreciating the nightlife, appreciating the stars. Uh, but just as yeah. I reached the edge of the uh, fire circle, I had almost a sixth sense and I turned around and there about two meters behind me uh, was a young leopard a crouched stalking low to the ground. Uh, so that's an experience you don't forget readily. I looked into its eyes for uh, maybe two, three very long seconds. I said something uh, quite understated, like, I think there's something behind me. And one of my family members turned around with a powerful torch or a flashlight, uh, so caught it in the full beam. Uh, obviously, it's an ambush predator. Uh, so once it's been seen, it's very unlikely uh, that I was in any danger. Uh, but the aftermath of that story uh, was that the incident was reported to the local authorities. And I'm fairly sure the leopard in question was either relocated or shot, uh, which is quite saddening really it wasn't the leopard's fault in any way it's it's unnatural behavior uh, but likely caused by feeding from other campers so a young leopard of that sort should not be stalking humans it's not uh, the right prey for it uh, but if it had come to associate humans with food uh, causing that human animal conflict uh, it's again the human's fault uh, but the leopard is paying the consequences so uh, that was something which really uh, stuck with me uh, for many years afterwards, definitely uh, shaped who I am today. Yes, sir. So uh, it seems that you have worked with a lot of uh, organizations around the world and still you are working. So you know quite a lot about the challenges they face. Uh, what Can you please share some of them, some of uh, those experiences? So some uh, challenges always uh, remain same for everyone. 
yeah, uh, many, many challenges in terms of what's being faced by the field, so environmentalism as a whole, and youth within that as well. Uh, so that can be the same or it can be different in terms of uh, the challenges faced by youth. A uh, big one's credibility. Uh, it can obviously be hard to gain recognition uh, by other groups, by charities, by uh, stakeholders uh, for the work you may be doing or for your ideas, for your vision to make an impact. Uh, so that's a big one. Uh, but thankfully, uh, decreasing as we're seeing the youth movement grow. Another one is applicable to the entire space, and that is funding or gathering resources. Uh, so obviously, a lot of the work we do is voluntary. I run human nature projects as a volunteer. Uh, so often when we're trying to make impact, uh, then we find that we have to uh, just do so in our own time, in our own space. So uh, that is uh, really something I've learned and seen replicated across the field. Uh, it's one of the things I find especially inspiring about working in environmentalism, that everyone is so, so passionate uh, because often there isn't good pay or any pay in many cases. So uh, that is a constant struggle. Uh, gaining resources, gaining grant support uh, to be able to undertake our projects. A uh, third one uh, then is the knowledge gap. Uh, so we've mentioned education a few times, uh, but I recently did a survey of about a thousand uh, people uh, from all backgrounds across the globe, and they scored worse than random chance in eight multiple choice questions there were. Uh, so uh, they don't not know about environmental issues, uh, they actually know the wrong things uh, about the state of our environment, uh, which is really quite fascinating, scary uh, to realize uh, because it means uh, that uh, we're being uh, taught the wrong things so we don't realize what's going on uh, with our planet. Uh, we think perhaps in many cases the opposite is taking place. Uh, so I mentioned the case of rhino poaching earlier in South Africa. Uh, it's a case where conservation has succeeded incredibly uh, we've seen those numbers of uh, these incidents have halved over the past five years, uh, but most people think they've doubled uh, because that's what the media uh, coverage is mostly saying. Uh, that's uh, the way uh, that our dramatic worldview is uh, causing us to perceive uh, global affairs. So uh, in terms of that knowledge gap, uh, youth especially uh, struggling to be involved in these spaces, uh, because they feel they're some, in some way inadequate, uh, they don't have uh, the skills, equipment uh, to make an impact, which of course is rubbish. Anyone can contribute to this space and it's incredibly, incredibly diverse and all the more powerful for it. Uh, so yeah, I think those would be the three main issues I've encountered and seen across the globe uh, with all the work I do, uh, but obviously there are many that we face and uh, as you say, constant amongst everyone. Yes, sir. So we have uh, another question from our core team here. Having experience of uh, speaking in TEDx platform is really appreciated. What is your opinion regarding importance of environmental talk in any normal platform for you? Yes. Yeah, so I mentioned briefly earlier uh, about the power of webinars, especially during COVID. I think uh, platforms like this uh, where uh, youth especially are able to share their thoughts, raise their voices, are incredibly powerful. Uh, so especially when we're not able to meet together as communities, uh, when uh, perhaps uh, some of those in-person actions, uh, the conservation field work, it's not possible, uh, then being able still to maintain that momentum uh, to create solutions through uh, these virtual platforms, through video conferencing, uh, is really uh, the goal we're all headed towards. Uh, we've seen uh, this uh, uh, 2020, which was meant to be a biodiversity super year, uh, has uh, been severely impacted by COVID-19. Uh, so all of these major conferences I mentioned, the multilateral um, government uh, uh, conferences, hopeful agreements that were going to be forged there, uh, have uh, been either postponed to 2021 or beyond or uh, completely cancelled. So uh, it's a matter of trying to go back to our roots in environmentalism. Uh, which essentially is a grassroots movement. It comes out of uh, people connecting in communities, building events like this, uh, building platforms like this, to be able to uh, share their thoughts and create solutions. Uh, so that's definitely something COVID has 
uh, brought up and the power of uh, webinars and of talks like this as well. Uh, yes, sir. So everyone, let's have an ice cream. Oh, I forgot the pandemic is still here. Just kidding. Let's have an ice breaking session. Sir, we heard that you are a great storyteller and you write a lot of things. So would you please share one with us and we would love to hear it from you, sir, please. Sorry, a story? Yes, sir. We would like to hear a story from you. Yeah, well, another really memorable uh, moment I had uh, during my career, and I mentioned earlier, I spent uh, four weeks uh, volunteering in France, uh, so caring for injured raptors. Uh, one of the birds we had there, and I've got many stories about these animals, uh, but one in particular uh, was a favorite of mine. It was a griffin vulture. Uh, so. I don't remember its name. Uh, all of the animals we take into care have names, uh, but I don't remember uh, the name of this particular individual. Uh, so I think it must have been in, in care for maybe four, six weeks. Uh, it was quite a long-term case. Being in winter, it has to be uh, fully recovered before releasing it. Uh, so uh, the issue was, uh, as is often the case over there, uh, there was lead shot uh, being used by hunters, uh, which is legal uh, during certain seasons in France. Uh, so uh, hunters were using this lead shot, uh, which had caused a, uh, a bioaccumulation of the toxins in the vultures, which of course the scavengers. Uh, so they'd ingested uh, way too much of this lead and uh, been uh, severely incapacitated. So uh, this griffin vulture had to come into care and yeah, I, I, I came to know it very well. Uh, I cared for it over many, many, many weeks. Uh, they eat uh, a sort of haggis, uh, if, if you want to describe it as that. Uh, it's a haggis type meal they have. Uh, so uh, giving that once a day, and lots of water, giving it regular che checkups uh, for its health, uh, giving it uh, medications as necessary. Uh, but right at the end of my time there, uh, it came time to do the release and I, I can still vividly, vividly picture this in my mind today. Uh, we did it in a place in the French Alps uh, where there was a lot of uh, scientific work, conservation work being done uh, for the vultures, the griffin vultures included. Uh, so uh, at this uh, location, it was a sheer precipice. Uh, so stunning, stunning drop uh, thousands of meters below. Uh, but on this cliff edge, uh, there uh, were maybe two dozen sheep carcasses left out. Uh, so from local farmers whose uh, livestock had perished and who'd volunteered it to go to this cause. Uh, so they left out these uh, carcasses of the sheep and uh, used that as a means of attracting the vultures and counting them, studying them. Uh, they knew all of them by name. Uh, so there were hundreds of them circling overhead and they could point to each one and being able to point it out, uh, tell you a bit about its story, a bit about its life history. Uh, really amazing work being done there. Uh, but yeah, uh, you transport vultures of this kind in large dog kennels uh, for uh, the trip there. And uh, it's a two-person job to handle a vulture for obvious reasons. You have one person uh, getting it around the waist, like bear hugging it, and another controlling the neck, uh, which is very flexible, could cause uh, some damage if it uh, rotated its head around, obviously. Uh, so uh, myself and a colleague uh, took it out of the kennel and let it go, uh, let it fly. Uh, so it soared, it glided off uh, this precipice and joined uh, hundreds, as I say, of its uh, counterparts circling overhead. Uh, still, I see the sun flashing off their wingtips. A really, really incredible sight, majestic birds, and that's uh, fairly misunderstood as well. Uh, so uh, that's a story uh, which just stuck with me again to today. Sir, that was a wonderful story, and I really loved it, and our audience, audience also loved it. So. Well, dear audience, now time for the truth. 
who do you think our eco lover winner is? The person who mentioned uh, the highest number of friends, and among them, the second runners up is. Sultana Yushra, and the first runner-up is Tabida Shargar. And obviously now time for the champion, so I guess all of you are well aware of it now. So, well, the champion is Mr. Ujannar. So, ma'am, you will be featured in our page shortly, and we'll continue. We'll contact you after this live, and thank you for sharing and mentioning our friends all over this session. It was really an interactive one. Um, so hope the winners are happy once paul oxen said that humanity can no longer stand by in silence while our wildlife are being used abused and exploited it is time we all stand together to be the voice of the voiceless before it's too late and extinction needs forever the interview went away so fast before the ending it's a small request to all of you huge amount of foods are waited go to your kitchen in the trash can you would see small amounts of wasted food it may be tiny to you but it could save lives take this outside and feed the stray dogs who are starving to death feed them and you will feel happy well and last but not uh, least you talents will have its last session of whitey dogs on 6th october remember it will be our season ending episode and with the, with Scott A. Thierry, the Secretary General and one of the 12 elected volunteer members of World Scout Committee. I again repeat, it's World Scout Committee, the main executive body of World Organization of the Scout Movement. All of you were invited there and that's all from our side today. Thank you for joining us and good luck to everyone. Have a nice day.